Adam Hunsaker ha had his first taste of teaching in 2010 when he taught a series of classes at the University of Utah Hospital. This experience resonated with him and he pursued a master's degree in nursing education from the University of Utah. He teaches in Blanding, as we just talked about, and also works as a nurse at a rural hospital where he hones his nursing skills. He lives at the base of the Blue Mountains with his wife, five children, and their beloved German shepherd named Chelsea. Chelsea. All right. Adam is an avid Cubs fan. Now, that can be difficult to be a Cubs fan, so I, good for you. <laughs> It is a good year, that is right. It is a good year if you're a Cubs fan. And can be found many weekends smoking meat, not smoking, smoking meat, and perfecting his bocce skills, as it's properly called, bocce. Not bocce, bocce. Please welcome Adam Hunsaker. No offense if you say it otherwise, but I was always top bocce, so. I had a wonderful experience. Last year, first semester, I got tired of PowerPoint, and I cut out PowerPoint entirely the second semester. I gave no student presentations with PowerPoint. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done, teaching-wise, I should say. Trying to captivate students without using PowerPoint is really hard. And I found out what a big crutch it was for me in my teaching. Case studies were awesome. I could, I could chew up a whole hour just on reading case studies. I'd still hit all the major points in my lessons um, with these case studies, but the basic case studies, as you walk through as a class, you assign a case and you talk about it, the students kind of lost interest after a while. And I really thought on how I could increase student engagement. Now, there's a computer program called Figure One. It's an app. It's also on the internet but it gives case studies for students. And with these case studies, you can look at different aspects. They'll show a picture of, the, of what the patient, like what they look like, and they'll give like a background. They usually give the gender, the age, and a short synopsis of what happened. I lo and it's kind of fun. It's been banned from my house, and I promise I won't show you anything scary. But my wife doesn't like it so much because like skateboarder versus window, like they had really cool pictures, right? And they showed like how the skateboarder came into the emergency room, and then after the doctor sewed them up what happened. And they talk about what happens in between. But I promise I won't show anything scary. I've had that before. It's not fun at conferences. So all the pictures I'll show you, are, they're, they're pretty good. But I would take these case studies with the students, and I would I'd give them some basic framework they could work with. But they each got to pick their own case as it came off. Um, and we'd, I'd put nine up on the screen, they could sit and pick and choose. Now this is very good. My students, I've got some who want to be community health nurses, some who want to work in intensive care units, some who want to work in the emergency room, labor and delivery, these different areas. And they can take a case study, and we can talk about it from the area like, say like a skin wound. You know, a skin wound isn't that intense sometimes, but if, depending what kind of area you're in in nursing, it greatly changes what happens and how you would treat certain things. And my students really like this because I, they could pick the picture, they could pick, I'm going to be in the ICU, I'm going to be in the clinic a week later. They could pick where they wanted to be. And the questions I had, they focused on three things. What the nurse can do right now, will it work, and why? And I went in more depth with my students, but I want to know what you're going to do with the students. Is it going to work? And then I want a one-week follow-up. Did it work a week from now? This was the hardest question for my students because really in their heads, they're like, okay, great. The patient comes in. I'm going to put an IV in. I'm going to do all these steps. But once you hit hour six, they had no idea how to care for this patient. Um, the case studies that we talked about, we had a lady who burnt her hand working in a nail salon. We had a male in his 20s who fell into a fire burned his chest horribly, inhaled smoke, burned the inside of his lungs. We had a little child who was burned. We had a person with an e-cigarette with the battery that exploded and burned the leg. All these different cases, and the students could look at it from a perspective, and they knew the first six hours what to do. But one week later, they were so lost. 
they had no idea. And so this forced them to think, what would happen one week later? What would I do a week later? And this is really good, especially like my intensive I, what, the ICU nurses, intensive care unit. I had some really bright students, but they just knew how to keep them alive. They didn't, like, they couldn't think about what happened at rehab. And when you talk about what happens at rehab, especially with nursing, really, we're setting people up. And nursing students, wherever they work, you're always trying to set someone up for the next stage, prepare them. So as they go through the system, through the hospital, they're prepared. This helps the students develop a story, a patient care story. And the patient care story is very important. These patient care stories, they learn when they see multiple patients. And when they see pictures, that kind of helps them. It's not as good as when they're actually the nurse taking care of the patient. But these stories that people make in their heads of how a patient should progress are vitally important. Charles Duhigg, he wrote a book that came out this last year. Um, he's a writer for the New York Times. He writes about how this story is important as people understand the story, and specifically with nurses, that they can better extrapolate what should happen. And they can pinpoint when someone isn't fitting the story. And when someone doesn't fit that story, then they dig in deeper and find out why. So this was a very good example of how, helping students figure out and try to develop that story. Now here's some slides. And this one's not offensive unless you study. If you study colon cancer cells, maybe this one might scare you. <laughs> Sorry, one person's scared. But this is essentially what it looks like. You have a picture of, and they'll have like the person, the face, the chest, whatever. And it's all HIPAA compliant, so I can show all this. And that's what I like. Not that I'm touting this one particular platform, the figure one, but I think it, it's really good that there was something already made for me that I could use for my students. So you can find whatever is specific for your discipline and you can dive into that. This was an EKG or rhythm strip on someone, and I'm sorry it's sideways. But, and these are the fun ones too, like they'll tell you, here's what the patient looked like, they'll show one later and they say, and they died at this point. And then they'll say, how could I have done different later? This is the discussion post, and this is really good for the students. The students can look through this and see there's doctors, nurses, and there's people who aren't qualified with credentials, but they're still on there. But they talk about what happens, how the patient progressed. And it's really fun to see these and they'll say, what can I do different next time? And the students, when they get assigned this case, they can dive in deeper. So they'll just see a picture and say, that's cool, I want to do that. But then they can dive in deeper. This is what your heart looks like, or your, your blood, when you've had too many hamburgers. It's a whole lot of lipids in that blood sample. That whole white part of the top. But the students, as they get this and they can dive in deeper, they can open up the case study. And then they can look and they can find out more of the backstory. So we, I assign the students, they have those questions, and then they work by themselves. And I gave them five minutes of question. And I, I sat there and was available for questions while they, if they had any questions through there. And they've stayed pretty much on task. But the best part was, and after this, we had student sharing. And we would go through the sharing aspects. And we'd start with like the lady who burned her hand. Now, a hand is really important. And she had burned her thumb and her forefinger. And so that's going to cause a lot of problems. And we talk about the rehab that had to go through, what's happening at the cellular level, the, the problems with a burn. And then we could progress to the bigger cases the guy who burned his leg with the e-cigarette lighter. We can talk about him. What kind of rehab will he need? And we're continually building. Eventually, we get to the guy who fell in the fire. He not only had to have surgery on the exterior part of his chest, but he has inhalation burns also. And as we build these layers, working with the students, eventually we get to the little kid who got burned and what happened to him. And we can, we've already talked about all the aspects of taking care of a burn patient, but now we can say, what's, what happens when he goes home? Say he's three months out, he's in the hospital for three months, now he goes home, what kind of support system does the family need? Do they need extra help? Is he going to be at school? Is he going to be ostracized for having a burn, for being disfigured? And we can talk about different things on different levels. And that's why I thought that was such a good example of a case study. Now, I do not profess to be an art, art teacher, artist, anything. These are my notes that I make for these classes when I do the case studies. I, I make a kind of like bulleted list and things I want to talk about. And before I go into the into class, I have this mapped out. Because it's, it's kind of scary, because sometimes 
the students talk about crazy things and they go so far off topic, right? And you're kind of worried because you don't know where the class is going to go. I find that kind of exhilarating also because I really hate that planned. You know, the unknown is kind of fun to have. And so with this, I had to build kind of a structure so I knew as the students would talk about certain things as they walked through the case study, I would check things off. I made sure we hit all the points. And it was really good also, one of the students would hit, you know, part of I was going to talk about, maybe they talked about like the wound healing or the pain, how much pain this burn patient was in. We could talk about like where the nerves sit in relation to like the burns. And the great part was I could ask just a simple one or two sentence question to lead the student to talk more about this and have a good discussion. And I can tell you, we hit almost every point on this, like when we went through just with the case study. And it was so much, it was very refreshing not to have to sit there and lecture and tell them. I decided to go even a little more interesting. I don't know. I gave them more leeway. I said, you don't, I said, with this different type, of, and I call it the same question case studies, but I just said, pick an example. And we're in the renal system, so kidneys, ureters, bladder, they could pick anything in there, something had to go wrong, and they could, they could talk about it. And they had to write the case study and they had to present to the class. Um, this was my rubric, and I'm going to tell you the rubric will save you when you do these. A well-written rubric is worth its weight in gold. It helps focus the students. Now, not that I'm a good example of case studies, but the next one we're going to talk about that I did later in the semester, that's the next rubric. And I'll, we'll go more in depth on this next rubric, but just so you understand, I was really kind of trying to form the idea of how case studies would work and how they could work in this, in this kind of scenario. Um, one of the things I found was they, they, students need standardized forms. They need to know what they're doing. It helps them focus better with the rubric. This is one of my students' submissions for this assignment, and I love this. So I like to do a simulation lab app also. So my students submit the assignments. After they're done submitting, I would tweak one of them just a little bit, and then within a week we'd go in the lab and we'd have a, a patient scenario where this would actually happen. Now, this one was about an African-American male boxer who got in a bar fight after he had a prize fight. Um, and this is all the students' work. And this is pretty amazing considering how poor my rubric was. I was really impressed with this. Um, they had to have three stages. What happened as the patient progressed through this. Um, so kind of he shows up. They give him some medications for pain. He gets some flank pain, but nothing worse than usual. And then they start giving medications in stage three. Um, and they realize something bad is happening to his kidneys. Now, when we get back into here, into the labs, the fun part is these lab results, and I don't want to dive into lab results so much, but the lab results look kind of blah. Nothing crazy. There's a few high things. We can see that, you know, there's a few high labs. The H on the side means high. And as we scroll down, the one on the bottom, the GFR, that's high. Well, the problem is he's African-American, and the students have to know, and the students wrote this. I was so surprised. African-Americans have their kidneys work a little different. This is the glomerular filtration rate. And so the students, actually, this is a critical value, and his kidneys are shutting down because he's African-American. Um, and that's pretty much the crux of this case study. They wanted people to recognize that some lab values can change. And I was very impressed because I had a pretty poor rubric, but they did still did pretty good. So then I took it a step further and I used that better rubric. I said, you can write whatever you want. We're talking about neurology this, this lecture. Now I have four semester nursing students. This is the year before, well, this is the last semester before they take their boards. And they're pretty good by now. And they've had this lecture at least twice before. So I gave them some pre work. They came to class. I had a three hour class. I said, pick your topic. What do you want? And I thought all of them would choose stroke, but they didn't all choose stroke. Um, and I gave them kind of an open-ended also, like, if you want to pick whatever you want, pick whatever you want. 
I was a little scared, but they did really good with this part. Now the rubric, I made more in depth. I wanted more substance to it. I gave them a 24 hour time frame. They had to go, the patient arrives, they have 24 hours, and they gotta tell me how the patient changes with this, in this time frame. And I want them to have specific time points of what happens, how the vital signs change, how the laboratory results change. And I want them to think also about different aspects in there. I kind of broke down the key points also on this next slide. Oh, one thing I almost forgot. Better finalize the rubric before you start. I made two changes once. I even told them several times and the students about killed me. It was a bad day. They like it. They like it finished, right? Even if something you say wasn't bad or was bad, you could say it better, just keep it the same. So I wanted, what are the vital signs? They had to give me three points within 24 hours of how this patient looks. So tell me the vital signs. How are they changing? Why are they changing? What aspect of, like, why is the blood pressure changing related to this neurological condition? I want the lab values. They had to give me 10 lab values total, and it was kind of fun. They gave me 20. And this was the best part of my whole thing. I really worry about lab values. When I teach my students, that's when the eyes gloss over and they just quit listening. But I said I want 10 lab values, I want three to change, and those three need to change with every step of the way. I want to know how it's changing, why it's changing, and I want you to understand behind it. I had the best, the best experience with this. Students who, my goal was to have him look up from his computer, you know, five times a lecture, like they actually look up, right? And like they were engaged, they were, they were talking about lab values, and my students were talking back and forth. And the hardest part for me was inside, they'd sit and they'd say something over and over again. And in my head, I'm like, like what, why would, how would the sodium change with this condition? How would the sodium change? And then they talk, how would the sodium change? And in my head, I'm screaming, it's going to go higher. It's going to go higher. But I, I, just, I, I didn't tell them that. But in my head, I'm just screaming, it's going higher, it's going higher. And I knew, I, at the time, I thought, they're going to go wrong. This is not going to work. They don't know. But every time they had a question like that, they got it right, eventually. And they had the group work, and they worked together. It was a wonderful thing. I also talked about the code status. So a code status, if you walk in the hospital, are we going to save you or not? Some people have cancer, they're terminal, they don't want to live anymore. That's fine. But I want them to address that with this patient. And I want that code status to change sometime. I also worked in here on the next side of like a moral dilemma, and that could have been part of it, but it's so hard for nurses. We are trained to keep everyone alive and save you as long as possible. And for someone to say, I'm done, just keep me comfortable, it's really hard. It's really hard for nurses, and I want them to experience and think about how that could happen, because it happens in the real world. I wanted to give medications. I wanted to have one medication they gave that did something good for the patient. One that did something horrible. One of them actually killed the patient when they, one of the students wrote, one of the medications they gave, killed the patient. And then I said, tell me why the medication was given. And I'll be honest with you, when you come to the hospital, if you're unconscious, we give you lots of medications to keep you alive. We're not trying to kill people. We're not in the business of killing people in nursing. We're trying to keep you alive. But sometimes we give medications and we don't, like the patient's unresponsive, they may have an allergy, we may give it. And I wanted the students to understand why a medication might be given when it wasn't correct. Dr. Dror, he's a Harvard graduate, he works with nurses a lot. He also works a lot with the US Air Force. He's in the United Kingdom. He did studies and he found when you teach students to look for how to fix medical errors, they actually learn better than if you tell them don't make an error. Because when they can see the ramifications of how, what a bad medication can do and how it can hurt someone, that cements in their brain, that teaches them much better than repeating over and over again, don't make a medication error, don't make a medication error. In nursing, we have the five rights when I went to nursing school, and now we're like to 10. They keep adding rights, you know, to make sure you don't give the wrong medication. But really, we need to work on what happens if you give the wrong one. And this gives a student, the students the opportunity to figure that out and say, what happens if I give wrong medication? What are the ramifications? I want them to know, how's the patient changing? What's the assessment look like? What are the, what's the family saying? during this. And then one of the most important parts is I want an explanation because when you get six pages from people, sometimes you have no idea where they're going with it. And it's really hard to figure it out. So an explanation, have them just one sentence at the very top of the paper say the patient's having a hemorrhagic stroke. 
that right there will tell you and set your mind up. It helps with grading. It also helps focus the students so they know. I've got a few examples of my students who, who did this. Sixty-two-year-old female, and by the way, these are all fake, made-up names and everything. There are some names on this, but they're all fake and made up on all the examples. But she's brought in. Brought in she has a fever. She just doesn't feel well. Um, you know, she had a rash, lymph nodes. And I thought it was really, you know, there's a some kind of pea allergy. It starts with a P. It's some medicine that starts with a P. And I like this a lot. The nurse never went back to check out what that pea allergy was. And as the student, or as the patient progresses through this problem and they have more we find out they have meningitis we do a spinal tap they have meningitis so we give Zinicef which has a trade name that starts with P so then start breaking out in hives they can't breathe very well unfortunately this patient they, this one they killed off they, they let them die it's always funny when I kill people off in my simulations and scenarios they get upset with me, but they kill their patients off too. So, I like this. It was very good. It's a good example. I have a better one here. I'll show you in a second. And really, I did not give them a good background on how to set this up a good system. And that's one thing going forward. I want to make a kind of set up a, a system they can kind of fill the blank in. And they have a format that works better for them. One also thing also, these students, they're very smart. They had three references they used or four, I think, anyways, but they said, they looked at different case studies. You have to be careful, because you can look up case studies on the, on the internet. You can find these, they're not hard to find. And these students, they looked at three different case studies, and they kind of saw how things should have gone, and then they ended up kind of making a morph of all three, but at least they gave them credit. So, but be aware, they can plagiarize and steal these. This is my, by far my best one, the students submitted. So they talk about lady who, you know, she's brought in, and they have it broken up perfectly, and I like this because I was so open, I can use this kind of the basis for next time, but they just set things up so well. They talk about how she changes, they have distinct time frames, it's about an hour and 15 minutes apart, and it's, it's just very good. They have the labs, they have the labs change each time, and you can compare them side to side. This patient had neurogenic shock. And this is a condition where your blood vessels open up. Essentially, you lose your blood volume and you die, or you can die. Um, and this is also, they give a medication they weren't supposed to give also. So, I had a lot of fun with this. It was great. It really was. I found out that you gotta check in with the students. I checked in right, right at first. I got them up in groups, and I said, which, is, which, which topic are you picking? Now, I have students, they're not just in one area. I have students in four different cities. I'm on IVC. Um, that's what I teach on. And so it was kind of hard. We break them up in groups, but they're not like they can just sit in their each area. I have one, in, one student in one city and two students in several cities. And so I like to get groups of three. And worked really well. I actually had used FaceTime. They used... I had some students use the IVC. We turned the volume down the other sites, and those two could just talk. Um, they would conference call, all sorts of things. But they could, they made it work, even though they were like miles apart, they could still talk and develop these case studies. So we talked to them at first. I talked to them in the middle. Now these ones in the middle, this is a three hour class, and we used almost every minute. Now they had two 20, or two 10 minute breaks, about 20 minutes total. I thought they'd take you know, a 30 minute break, because I wasn't really watching them. But they had so much fun with this, and they did so well, they actually cut their break short just to get this going. But I, I stopped with them. I talked to each group for about 10 minutes. I had them give me the whole scenario, tell me what they were looking at, why the patient was reacting a certain way, and tried to kind of push them because they're still students. They're still learning, and they, they might forget, oh, the patient needs a, you know, a CAT scan, a CT scan. The patient needs an X-ray. The patient needs this lab also. And they could build that in. I, I also checked the last 10 minutes of class. Well, last 30, sorry. Last 30 minutes of class, I check it. And I check in with them and kind of point them. Not all of them finished before the time was up. But that way, with the check-in, I could say, all right, you need to finish this before we turn it in. 
these are the few things that you're, you're lacking on your assessment. Um, and I, I was there as needed. And kind of like the keynote today, sometimes you're there and you're trying to seem receptive and you're screaming the answers in your head and they're, they're not asking you questions. This was the hardest thing of all. Trying to like look like you're receptive but not be bored out of your mind, right? Because they're going through these scenarios that are so easy for you but yet are so hard for them and they have to look things up. So in the future, I'm going to flip it a little bit so the students start before class. And I think I'd take care of that because when we start, if they start, the, if they get halfway done before class, we can kind of mold it, finish it, and then I won't be bored so long, right? And there's a few other reasons why. We'll get to that at the end, though. But that's, that is one of them. And as the students write these case studies, it really helps them form that story. It helps them cement the story. So in Charles Duhigg's book, is what I mentioned earlier about the, from the New York Times. He talks about this neuro, sorry, newborn ICU nurse. She's walking through the unit. There's a baby with a nurse. So they, that was her patient. And she just looks at, the, looks at this baby and she stops and she, something's wrong. She can't say what's wrong, but something's not right. And she talked to the nurse in charge, and the nurse with the baby was a younger nurse, and the baby wasn't that sick. The baby was actually doing very well through the stage, but the, the nurse, she was experiencing, the, ba the nurse was not right, or sorry, the baby was not right. And this nurse had a story in her head that she talked about later, because she couldn't tell you the time, but she knew something was wrong. And as, as things progressed, they waited a few minutes, they talked, and this nurse was so concerned, she said, go find the doctor. By the time the doctor got there a few minutes later, the nurse had enough set up that she said, look, I'm worried about this. They just had a, did a heel poke on the baby. They took some blood from the heel, and it was bleeding a little too much. The vital signs were off, but they weren't really bad. Anyways, and she, and she had a few more things. She said, I think the baby has a systemic infection. Now, with babies this small, we can't tell if they have an infection until they're, they're dead, essentially. Like, the lab results don't come back until they're dead. And so... They drew labs, the doctor started antibiotics, and the baby, in fact, had an infection. And they saved this baby. And they've, they've done research and they've found that nurses who can tell the story of how students, or sorry, how patients progress through the hospital, those nurses' patients have lower mortality rates because they can think in their head exactly how it should go, how it should play out. And they don't have that problem. Well, they can't always tell you exactly what the problem is, but they know to look and find out more because there's a problem. There's something going on. They don't know what it is, but something's going on. And they have that story in their head. And this is what case studies help you do. And they help the students learn this. Um, with, my, with these case studies, I have the students, I, I take them, I take all their case studies, change a few things so they don't know exactly what happens because the same students that wrote the case studies end up coming to the simulation lab and we'll put a patient in there. Um, this is my mom. She can give birth. She can do everything. She can, she's died many times. We bring her back. She dies again. Right? But the students get experience with this. They get experience as we run the scenario they have. When we change those few things, they learn what's going on. They learn how they can help the patient, and they learn what not to do. I put alarms on. They get alarm fatigue. We do all kinds of stuff. I put so many meds that sound alike right by each other that frequently are wrong medications given. And, the nurse, and then it's kind of fun because the students get so... They get so flustered because you have three meds right in a row that look alike. Now, in real life, we separate them. But I want them to realize they need to look their medications up. And these, these students get so flustered. I even had some students that gave the right med, and like they just gave 10 times too much because they were so worried that they found the right medication. Finally, they're so happy, and they gave the wrong, they gave the wrong dose. With, with these scenarios, it really cements, and it helps the students learn how it should progress how things should work. Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Blink, talked about how you need to go through so many 
scary experiences before you can react appropriately. And if you've ever had a baby almost die on you, that's a scary experience. Or if you almost had even just a regular person, babies are the worst, but like if you had a regular person almost die on you, it's a very frightening experience. As a nurse working in the hospital, that's scary. Case studies help these students kind of work through that. They help, they get them a taste for it. They learn how to react and we don't have, like they, the patient can die and no one gets in trouble. I have, a, I have a student lead this scenario. And the last time I did this, I actually had the student write the whole thing. I had to make a few tweaks. She made a few, there's a few funny things in there. But she took the scenario, she tweaked it, she ran the whole thing, she ran the computer. It was great. They gave a wrong med and they gave the wrong dose, a super dose of a cardiac med on the wrong patient. And it was awesome because then the student nurse, she's sitting there and she looks at me and I, I let her run the whole thing. I was a doctor, I, they could phone call me but I had very little to do with the scenario. They ran very well. And she's like, what do I do? I said, well, what would happen? What if you gave this big dose of metoprolol? She's like, well, I dropped the heart rate and I lowered the blood pressure. I was like, great, go for it. And she ran the machine and she did it. And it's kind of fun because like, she still tells me, I'm not gonna make a medication error. <laughs> At least those two kinds, right? She's, she was in two of those centers where they made major medication errors. And these simulations help cement it and help they can see things, what's going on. And as Dr. Dror said, when they learn what happens with errors and how to fix those errors, that leads to better outcomes where they're not actually going to give a wrong medication or wrong error. I'm almost out of time. I talk about what I would do in the future differently. I really want that formatted paper where it works better for him. I want him to start it in class. And the best piece of advice I got last year from a student, she was kind of upset with me. And I didn't like the feedback until I thought about it for a long time and she says, I want to hear what my peers do. We'd have one simulation event. We'd talk really in depth about one thing. And by flipping it and having them start at home, then we can have a better discussion in class. Because when we do those case studies I mentioned at first, we all talk about them, we kind of gather up, we talk, we figure things out. But with these ones, they write these really good case studies and they only find out about one. So by having them start at home, they could have a better, they could hear what their peers are doing also more in depth. And they could appreciate that. So I hope you get that feeling someday where like the student keeps asking that question over and over can't answer but you're screaming in your head and I hope that you get when you have to end up in the hospital you get nurses who've been trained so you're not the first case they've ever seen even if it's just a case study they've seen a few more so they can better take care of you thank you Yes. seen lots of case studies that you can, like, like something like the figure one. It doesn't, I haven't seen, like, the figure one, it's kind of like a shell, right? Okay. A lot of the other ones I've found, they actually give you the whole case study, like, they run through the whole thing. So there are some you can find where, like, they'll give you parts, but they're not, like, they're going to give you the whole thing. You have to, like, break those parts up for the student. So there are some resources out there. I have seen some like that, yes. I was just trying to get my students to think more kind of cut things off so they had to think more and not have everything. Any other questions?
And it's hard for me as for the development of the story. Like, we were at clinicals. We take patients to the or students to the hospital, and one of our patients died. And he was like seven to seventies, and I remember all my nursing students were crying, and they're like, and they're just like, one of them was like, can I start crying now? <laughs> And I was like, yes, you can. And she explained to me like why she was crying and the emotion she was feeling and how sad she was. The first time she ever saw anyone die. And I've, I've seen dead babies. Sorry. If you're like over 50, you had a great life. And, but we can talk about that and share that. And it was good for me to hear their perspective because their story was, I've never seen anyone kick the bucket. Where I, I'm kind of jaded because I've had so many experiences that doesn't bother me. So...